All right, here we are. We are live. All right, everybody on Facebook, welcome to Thunder and TK. Going to sit back and chat a little bit about money, power, Christianity, and capitalism. And if you have questions or comments along the way, feel free to put them in the comments section, and uh, and I'll be checking in every few minutes to to, uh, to dive in. Thunder, what's going on, man? How you doing over there? I'm all right, you know, getting it in. Recovering after I'm this, sorry, uh, Professor Professor Doctor Thunder. I know you didn't work hard to get that get that degree for nothing, you know. Yes, uh, you can throw some Grand Poobah and Reverend and some other stuff in there too, if you like. Um, <laughs> I'll take, I'll take anything Dr. you want to give me. <laughs> <laughs> well, heck, well, you, hey, man, I don't but, know. You, but you're the rev. You, you're the rev though, because you you a preacher's kid. So, yeah, man, TK to PK. I'm, I'm I'm proud though, man. I used to hate that when I was a kid. I used to hate being a preacher's kid. You know, like it's crazy to think that you would resent having a good dad. You know, my father is just amazing. But it took me a while to get around to appreciating that. But yeah, I'm a proud PK man. Proud PK. Hey, dude, we got a a lot of stuff I want to get into today, and I know we usually run out of time because we don't have a problem talking. So. I want to dive right in and, and uh, for this first topic, I want to talk about money and power. So, you know, Shannon Sharp, he is uh, him and Skip Bailey. So they host the Undisputed Show, which is a sports show. He's a former NFL player. Well, he had a conversation with Snoop Dogg about uh, Trump and power. I want to play this clip and then I want to I want to show you a, um, a screenshot and I want to I want to get your thoughts on what these guys have to say about money and power. So let's let's do this. Shannon Sharp, Snoop Dogg. You roasted Donald Trump. What was that like? I want to do it again. <laughs> nah, I mean, it was good for the cause because at the time, he wasn't as bad as he is. Right. You know? And that's what people don't understand is that power and fame could change you, man. Yes. He's the perfect example because he was a height until he got all of that power. Now, when he had a little bit of power, some towers over here and a little television show over here, and, you know, he'd get in a few venues and whatnot and have some golf tournaments, it was controllable. But when right. you give a man that much power and that much fame, it becomes uncontrollable. And that's where I felt like me and his relationship would end based off of, you know, the way he started acting when he got that power. We said it all the time. Man, you acting funny when you get money. Yeah, but he been had money, but he acting funny because he got power because he's able right. to do certain things and make things move in a different way. Cause a president is different than, you know, a governor, a mayor or a senator. Oh, you could have all the money in the world. Give me power. Jeff Bezos got a, a 200 billion, but he doesn't have the power that president Trump has. All these billionaires, they got, there's a lot, there's probably 2000 people that got more money than president Trump, but they ain't got the power he has. Power Trump's all. Right. And that's, and that's, crazy when somebody like that has that kind of power. I've always believed in that as a kid that God don't make no mistakes and he allows things to happen so we can learn from these things and, and get better as a community, as a, as a people and as a world. So I'm just looking at it for what it is and what it's worth. I know that it's God's plan on November 3rd to make a difference because we didn't been through enough for this year alone and not only just this last four years, but just clown in office. All right, man. So that was interesting to me, especially the part about Bezos and Trump comparison, saying that this brother's worth this much money and you can have all the money in the world, but it doesn't trump the kind of power that he is attributing to, to Donald Trump. And so I want to contrast that with something that I saw from Boyce Watkins today, which, which tends to be more characteristic of, of how I'm inclined to think. And Boyce Watkins says, hashtag black people can close the racial wealth gap by making wealth building principles a key component of our community culture. Our kids must be obsessed with three things, owning stock, buying real estate, starting businesses. This is how we will build Black Wall Street. Now, I would love to see kind of a discussion, a debate between the two of them and how Watkins would respond to what he had to say. But I, I wanna hear from you, man, on, on this whole thing of money and power, because a lot of people see money as, as a form of power, some people see entrepreneurs as being more powerful than politicians. Some see it the other way around. What, what is your take on that? And um, 
what's the kind of power we need to align ourselves with in order to, to create real change in the world? Okay, so first I want to respond to a particular implication that Trump is how is somehow worse now because he's president. Um, I that uh, I think Hollywood has to say that because they have to say that in order to save face. Because before Trump was president, they were they were buddy buddy with this guy, and you cannot tell me, you cannot convince me that this dude overnight changed totally. He was just as much a, a babe hound cheating on his wife. You know, uh, you remember that, 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 uh, that tape that they unearthed, you know, was when he was doing the apprentice. That was before he was, you know, the president, when he was on the bus talking about grabbing, you know, <clears throat> grabbing women or whatever. So they knew that this cat was the way he was. He was buddied up, cozied up with the Clintons. I mean, you have all those print pictures with the Clintons, with different Hollywood stars and everything else. And it's just incredible to me the lengths that people will go to try to revise history so that they can <laughs> so that they can save face later. All of the, you know, the hip hop, uh, you know, the rappers and stuff where Trump was glorified because he was seen as this kind of success story, um, you know, but, you know, but now he's a, he's a slumlord and, you know, he's the scum of the earth and he's a, you know, he's a uh, the white supremacist and he's all of this, all of this evil stuff. Now, look, um, I didn't vote for this cat. Um I won't vote for this guy. I'm more of a third party. You know, I have more of a third party perspective, but I just, I just find it amusing <laughs> that, uh, that folks are trying to save face. Um, this is a, this is a slight tweak to some of the um, revision that I've seen just to claim that somehow he's, he's different now than he was before. And the thing is, um, uh, the money that he has, uh, I think that that is uh, more hey, powerful hey, hold up, hold up, because hey, of the hey, kind of control. Hey, hey, Thunder. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can, can, we, can, can we can we push pause right here and, and talk about money in a, in a little bit? Because just, just that 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 uh, intro comment on how people kind of revise history, I definitely see that. I, I agree with you on that, right? Because it it does seem to be the case that in Hollywood, like you got to lock and step, lock and step. You know what I mean? Because if if you don't, do, do you really want to work out here? But I also feel like I see that on the other end, too, where, you know, you and I have both been immersed in evangelical Christian culture at different levels. And before Trump was running for president, if you had asked those people, you know, or people in that demographic, what they thought about his morals, what they thought about his Christianity or whatever, they would have dismissed him as probably not even a, a believer or not to be taken seriously along those lines. And a lot of that talk has reversed. And there's this sense of like, this is this is God's man, or this guy is somebody who cares about the Christian principles of this nation. And so I think this is one of those things that politics just does to people because so much of politics is about fighting against what you hate that that even if you're presented with an option that you don't love you're kind of forced to defend it because anything better than that guy anything better than that guy and so you find yourself kind of making exceptions and making excuses for people saying and doing things that you would never accept if they weren't part of your political party i mean we even see that with biden now where Biden was being criticized pretty heavily, as was Harris, being criticized pretty heavily as people that didn't have black folks and black concerns in mind. And now it's kind of like, well, don't talk about that now because, you know, we got to get them in office and they're not Trump. I just think that's kind of like what politics does to people. It, it, it screws up their thinking in a way to where people are forced to defend things during an election cycle that they never defend in everyday life. Now, I think there's a I'm going to pull out a, a bit of a nuance here. I, I, I agree with what you're saying, by the way. 
And I have found it very hard to justify. And this is why I feel morally that I can't vote for someone that has some of the sort of character flaws that he has. Um, hmm. However, I think prior to the election, part of the reason why evangelicals wouldn't have supported him is because um, <laughs> it's because he's not really conservative, right? He's not, he, he, he um, has, uh, you're allowed to change your positions over time. Him being pro-life is a new uh, evolution. You know, that that's not what he was years ago. And so they would have those reasons plus other reasons probably why they wouldn't want to deal with the guy. And I do think that it is, hmm. it's too bad that with the sort of uh, binary, you know, uh, political system that we have that, you know, there's no, there's no room for that. There's really no room for uh, the, well, at least the, the the media, the national media is not making any space for third party considerations. I mean, if imagine what both of the presidential debates that we just saw, the, the first debate where it looked like two kids arguing and then <laughs> and then the second date where instead of actually talking about the the debate uh many of the news outlets have been focusing on the fly that's <laughs> that was on pence's head for yeah, a couple yeah. minutes um and if you look on facebook you see all these people just posting a picture of a fly and you're supposed to just understand what that means um uh it's 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 pretty humorous actually but Imagine if there was a third party uh, perspective in on those debates, not that the third party person would necessarily get get in office, but that it would force the Democrats and the Republicans to have to actually have a real conversation and have to deal with some of these different perspectives. And then whoever wins would be forced to have to roll into their platform some of these other ideas because too many people heard in discussion about those ideas. Yeah, man, I heard this anecdote once about these two guys who were hiking and um, they, they see from the distance a bear. And uh, one friend says, uh oh, what are we going to do? And the other friend, he calmly takes off his book bag. He pulls a pair of running shoes out of his book bag, puts them on, begins to lace them up. And his buddy said, what are you doing? You think we can outrun that bear? And he says, oh, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. you know? <laughs> and classic example of a situation where you don't need to be fast. You just need to be faster than the cat you're running against, right? We had Kamau and I, we had Larry Sharp uh, on our Revolution of, of One live stream, uh, which is Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. and he was talking about, you know, Larry Sharp ran for governor of New York for the Libertarian Party. And he was saying how when he was going up against Cuomo, how whenever Larry had the opportunity to speak, he had to have an answer to every difficult policy question because nobody knows what libertarianism is. Nobody had heard of him before. So we had to have a well thought out answer to everything. And even then, I don't know if it really mattered that much. Cuomo, on the other hand, he, he didn't get those tough questions. All he had to do was just be like, I'm not Trump. I'm not Trump, right? And the funny thing about it is he wasn't even running against Trump, right? Trump wasn't running for governor. That wasn't his real competition. But but he could he could afford to look past his real competition and just be like, I'm not yeah. Trump. And his people would be like, yay, right? Like, because we, we're not voting for you because of what you are, but because of what you are not. And we should probably have a conversation with Larry at some point because he made a really interesting case for this whole idea that if you waste your vote on a third party, it's not really a wasted vote because there are there are other victories you can achieve for a third party beyond just winning. And so a lot of people find themselves in these situations where they're like, man, I don't really feel excited about either candidate. Right. I don't I don't feel excited about either one. But if I vote for somebody else it's gonna be a wasted vote. 
And Larry has a really interesting um, argument about how it's not and how if we keep thinking that way, we're just going to get the same options over and over again. But if we allow ourselves to waste that vote, we can accumulate long term victories that can make it more likely that additional voices can be heard in these debates, in these discussions. But right now, no doubt about it, man, mainstream media can easily afford to it to ignore ignore those third party candidates for sure. Yeah, on one of my uh, recent episodes of uh, conversations with Doctor Thunder, um, I had a I had this a portion of the conversation that we're having right now with one of my guests, and and they said he said you know third party sounds good you know you just wish that they would have gotten started earlier so that we knew who they were, and uh, I didn't. Hmm say what I'm about to say now, because, you know, we were moving, I was, you know, I had an agenda, I was moving on. But what I may have said is that the reason that that's the case is not because the third party uh, candidates are not known. It's that the media is controlling this narrative and it's much more profitable. It's much more profitable for it to appear to be this binary sort of system. It's this person versus this person. Um, for sure. Uh, yeah. Well, man, let's 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 talk about the money side of this, because what what Snoop and Shannon were saying was that money is where the power is. You can have all the money in the world, but none of none of those people like Bezos and so forth have more power than Trump. And Watkins wasn't directly addressing that, but he seemed to be hinting in the direction of economic self-sufficiency is where the power is, not in politics. I'm curious. What are your thoughts on that? I would totally agree with that. Um, well, first of all, it, it, as far as being president, you can only do that for eight years, right? But your money can carry uh, carry you far beyond that. And then not only that, but, uh, you know, your kids, you know, <laughs> carries on to them. I mean, I, there's a lot more power in, in, in being able to control your own destiny because you have the capital to support whatever initiatives, whatever ideas uh, that you have. Uh, and what, what's most important is being able to do the kind of things that directly affect you and your immediate community and your family, not these sort of big global things. Uh, I was having a conversation with um, a military guy uh, at the gym I think it was yesterday, actually, and we got to talking about politics and things. And one of the things uh, that we were talking about is the fact that if it's a Democrat or a Republican that gets in office, as far as policy goes, there's only going to be about a two to three percent difference in what actually happens, right? Mm -hmm. And how that's going to actually affect me, it, you know, locally. Right. Only about a two to three percent. And the reason for that, most of it is because when a new president comes in, you can't totally clean house. You can't eliminate everybody, including all of the workers, all of the bureaucrats, all of the people with their feet on the ground. You cannot do that. You need them <laughs> to, to run government. And so what ends up happening is in order for you to make astute decisions, you have to actually talk to those folks that are on the ground, right? And they're going to say, well, I know you campaigned on this, but here are the actual logistical reasons why you can't actually do that, right? And so you end up with very small changes. Now, in this, in this, in this situation, really the most powerful and lasting thing that the president can do is a, 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 a Supreme Court justices, right? That's that's the most lasting and most powerful thing that they can do. Uh, but the, but talking about the Supreme Court, actually, they have far more power than they ever were supposed to have. So actually, that power wasn't even intended to have the sort of uh, culture changing kind of power that that institution has now. Yeah, man, you know, it's interesting because during an election cycle, a lot of people express their biggest fear in terms of things like, I'm worried about who 
that person over there is going to vote for. Right. I mean, everybody seems to agree on the whole get out and vote thing, at least in the mainstream. But it's you scare me if you vote for this person. And, and, and you see a lot of that on social media right now. Right. Like, don't even talk to me if you plan on voting for this person over here. You don't really care about America, whatever. What what scares me, however, is this idea that the primary way we change society is through political figures. And I, I find it very interesting that we have understood power, influence, and social change in terms of I either have to become one of these political figures or I have to vote and get the right one in. And the first problem with that to me is just a practical problem. Even if I conceded all the philosophical assumptions that go along with it, that's a practical problem because mathematically, statistically, that's one of the areas of life where your real influence is pretty small. If you're lucky enough to live enough years, I mean, my gosh, you're, you're gonna have a few people that get in office you can't control, you don't like, and you feel like they're making the, the country worse. And and yeah, that's, that, that, that's a, that's a real thing, but it's the things that you do every day in the marketplace, in your own personal life, to create value for you, to create value for your family, to create value for your communities, to make the people around you better. I mean, that's the stuff, that, that's, the stuff that's gonna have a real impact. So I, I, I was on, I posted something on social media, right? Where I said, um, I was talking about how everybody is okay with being preachy about the vote. Which, which we don't accept with anything else. You know what I mean? Like if you're if you're sitting down eating some fast food and I bum rush you and I'm like, hey man, you need to stop killing yourself with that stuff. <laughs> if, if you turn out to be sick, if you turn out to be sick in 20 years, it's on your fault, right? It, I mean, it's, it, it's your fault. People will look at that as rude. I'm right though, I'm right. But people will look at that as like, bro, stay in your lane. Don't be so preachy. But when it comes to politics, people are very comfortable with saying things like, don't vote, don't complain. And my whole thing is, hey, look, I'm not trying to take that away from you, but what if we apply that same energy to like anything related to personal health and personal development? And what if we allowed ourselves to be that comfortable challenging each other on all of the unhealthy, self-defeating practices and philosophies that we endorse in our everyday lives? I think the changes we create that way are far more than the changes we create this way. And so I, I feel like I know where Shannon is coming from, but what I don't like is it, it kind of reinforces this idea of, of, you know, power is over there, power is out there. And it's like, okay, but that doesn't really leave you with a lot of options for how you show up after election day. It, especially, I, I, I find it, I find it hard to believe that people with the kind of platform that Shannon has, right? People are watching him all the time and he shares what he thinks about things quite often, right? So how is it that you're powerless? You know, it's, 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 I, maybe it, it would be one thing to insinuate, you know, someone that doesn't have that kind of national platform um that voting somehow is the only way that they can express their power but completely another thing when it's somebody that is on the you know that is on tv all the time and you know expressing these sorts of uh you know these sorts of ideas or you know this the sense of uh i don't almost defeatism I'm like that. It doesn't. It doesn't make a lot of. It doesn't. It doesn't ring true to me. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I got you, man. I got you. All right. We're gonna move on to it to a, um, another topic, but I I want to uh, read some of the comments that are coming in on the uh, on the live stream. All right. All right. Okay. So I have um, uh, Stephen or Stephen Hill saying Augustine City of God. Uh, Mark Tyson gives an excellent analysis of the Democrats' real agenda behind their push 
the remake and pack the Supreme Court. The quote from Senate Democrats proves that when we're on the losing side, as was the case with the 2016 presidential election, they threaten and intimidate the system with structural change so they can push their agenda at all costs. This is classic liberal political privilege, entitlement, and recklessness. Um, I'll have to check out that article. That might be a, um, an interesting topic for us to discuss. So I'll, I'll take a look at that analysis and, and maybe we can uh, go back and forth over it. AZ, many of us think there are not really two or even three parties. There are the Democrats, the Republican wing of the Democrat party and the Libertarian Democrat life party. That's, that's actually an uh, interesting perspective. Um, thank you for sharing that comment. Lori Turner, personal responsibility is your greatest power. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that for sure. You know, a lot of people kind of get, they get triggered by that phrase, personal responsibility. And I, I think I think one of the reasons is why when people hear responsibility, they hear blame. You know, so if I say, hey, man, that's your responsibility, it sounds an awful lot like that's your fault. And the reality is there are bad things that happen that affect us that actually aren't in our faults. Like incompetence is real. Fraud, dishonesty is real. And all sorts of people do do things that that negatively affect us and disadvantage us. The, the explanation for responsibility that I like comes from Wayne Dyer, where he said personal responsibility isn't blame, but it's the recognition that you have the power to respond with ability, right? It's about saying no one is ever going to care about creating change in my life like me. And so even if I do have some theoretical argument that you ought to care, it behooves me to take ownership of creating the changes that I care about because, you know, you wake up one day and you don't like your life. I mean, it's easy for people to say, I'm sorry, that stinks, but who's going to do anything about it if you don't, you know what I mean? So I, I look at I look at personal responsibility in that way. And I think s some people are, are so uncomfortable with that phrase that I, I've started using the phrase self-ownership, the idea of taking, taking charge of your life and the results that you want to create, you know? Yeah, you know, I was, uh, <clears throat> I was, discussing with someone they're they're trying to form uh sort of, sort of some punchy phrases about what their organization is going to be about and i suggested that they steer clear of uh words like social activism and uh there's a so there's like a sort of a parallel there right so if you say anything social responsibility, social activism, social, if you say anything with the word social in front of it, um, especially, especially right before an election, it is invariably the connotation sort of outweighs, uh, you know, what, what, what the real definition um, of, of what it is that you're saying. And uh, I'm not suggesting that all forms of social change or social activism are inherently bad. <laughs> I'm not saying that at all, but certain people are going to just immediately be turned off by that. Uh, whereas, um, you know, it, th this, the same thing with personal responsibility. I think, uh, you know, people hear that and they're like, oh, OK, so now, um, uh, you know, uh, this disparity between the, the rich and the poor doesn't actually exist. And and, uh, mm. you know and all of that kind of stuff. But the other thing I wanted to say, uh, and this is a little bit of a digression, but uh, we were talking about the power of the vote and you know, there's a lot of preachiness about the power of the vote. It's like, hey, you know, you gotta get out there vote, you better vote. You know, if you don't vote, don't complain and all, all of that. But notice that almost no one is saying what the true power of a representative democracy really is. And that is contacting your representative. <laughs> That's actually the true power because yes, a vote is important, but a vote can be canceled out by someone else voting the opposite of what you vote. But your conversation with your representative, making them aware of different perspectives, that is, that is always more powerful uh, and it's going to have the effect of actually making some of these 
adjustments and changes on a local level closer to you where you can actually experience the benefit of some of those changes. So. Yeah. So I, I want to try to one up it a little bit. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm such a, such a nice guy, but not really. I want to try to one up it a little bit and say, and also have conversations with yourself about the application of your creative ability to everyday life because political change it's always a reaction to the compound effects of individual change at the end of the day politicians will and can only do what they perceive to be politically profitable to do and usually when you see something like, uh, i give an example, like let's take uh, legalization of marijuana and, and how, how marijuana is being treated politically today versus where it was a decade ago. It's not that there has been some kind of enlightenment among politicians or politicians are more open-minded and informed about drugs or anything along those lines. It's because for the most part, there is a cultural momentum in the direction of, 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 of seeing marijuana as being less demonized as other drugs. Like people have bought into the idea that, A, there's a lot of medicinal value to this. It's, it's not as harmless as other kinds of substances and so forth. If there were like a true enlightenment, politicians would actually be advocating for the decriminalization of drugs and, and they would change their position on that entirely. But the attitude is for mar towards marijuana has changed because of individuals who are not in political positions pushing forward to do research, to have conversations that affect the way people see things. So I just wanna say to anybody that's listening, especially to people that are tempted to see creative effort as some kind of consolation prize, creativity is really the name of the game. And by creativity, I don't I don't just mean in the sense of like, oh, I'm going to stay home and uh, listen to some music like no, like taking seriously your ability to to create things, to start conversations, to put new ideas out there, um, because that's what politicians are reacting to. I think today's policies are always a delayed reaction to yesterday's creativity. You know, that's that's my take on it. But hey, let's let's go to. Um, Let's go to this Ben Shapiro clip you shared with me about, about universities, because I want to get your take on this. We're already at the half hour, man. It's crazy. Time flies. But I want to play this Ben Shapiro <laughs> clip right quick. There's a study <laughs> that came out in April of this year from Mitchell, Mitchell Langbert, Associate Professor of Business Management at Brooklyn College. And the study is from the National Association of Scholars. It compared the number of Democratic faculty for every Republican in 25 academic fields. There was a sample size of over 5,000 professors. So guess which majors were the least politically biased in terms of the breakdown? All the ones that earn. All the ones that earn. Okay, among engineering professors, there were 1.6 Democrats for every Republican. You think, oh, well, that's a 60% that's a imbalance. I mean, that seems, un that, that seems like a pretty major imbalance. That is the lowest level of imbalance among any major is 1.6 Democrats to every Republican, mainly because a lot of Democrats like to go into the education field, also because it's this sort of ivory tower mentality where everybody agrees with one another at these universities, but that's not supremely imbalanced. 1.6 Democrats for every Republican in engineering, right? Again, which is the highest earning major. Among chemistry professors, 5.2 Democrats for every Republican. Economics professors, 5.5 Democrats for every Republican. Professionals, 5.5. Mathematics, 5.6. In other words, all of the hardcore majors where you learn something and increase your income trajectory, you're subsidizing actual marketable commodities, not leftist professors. Now, here's the imbalance in the useless majors, as I like to call them. The majors in lesbian dance theory and sociology. Okay, here are the professor imbalances in these particular fields. Among liberal arts professors, for communications degrees, 108 Democrats in communications compared with zero Republicans. 56 to zero in anthropology. 70 to 1 in theology, 48 to 48.3 to 1 in English, 43.8 to 1 in sociology, 40.3 to 1 in art. In other words, this is Democrats subsidizing a bunch of majors that are not marketable with your taxpayer dollars in order to keep all their friends employed and in order to shovel people into a university system that pushes their political values. Well, OK, OK, that, that was interesting. So you shared that one with me. 
you're the university man, you're the academician. You know, I, I've spent a lot of time talking about the value of opting out of college, how you don't even need a degree in order to be successful. And I know, I know that, you know, there are laws that make it illegal to practice certain things if you don't have degrees in them. I get it. I am always forced to make that disclaimer and I do a very great job at it. But, you know, I'm, I'm not the one that's even pushing people towards college anyway. I'm far be it from me to be the cat that is defending college and whatnot. So I want to hear your thoughts on this, man. So this is a, um, it's, uh, it's kind of like shooting yourself in, in your own foot. So if it is, uh, I'm referring to this uh, liberal bias in, in the academy. So if it is your, your goal to reproduce your own views, um, to create a society filled with people that share more of your views, that are more liberal, then uh, the, a, a problem with having a significant bias is that students are not exposed to ideas from the other perspective. So when they're in a situation in uh, uh, where they could get some of their questions answered about some of these other perspectives to, you know, keep them on the same team, so to speak, uh, <laughs> you know, they're not getting any of that information. Um, and especially mm -hmm. when cancel culture uh, has caused people like Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson and, and other folks with um, more conservative views not to even be able to come on campus to present any of these different kinds of ideas. Uh, so then what happens is, is the student graduates never being exposed to any of these other ideas in a real way. So then the first person that they hear that actually under, you know, that actually has good arguments for these conservative positions, they can easily knock them off of that, whatever their liberal perspective is. So from the perspective of uh, the academy, it doesn't make a lot of sense why you wouldn't encourage or do a better job of encouraging these different ideas so that, you know, if, if you have issues with these these ideas, you can discuss those issues, you know, but uh, so that's, that's one of the issues in, in particular, I find it um, interesting that uh, uh, so schools of music uh, in conservatories around the country, uh, certainly the schools that I went to uh, in particular, um, my, for my undergraduate, my master's degree, um, and uh, other schools, you know, that, you know, colleagues of mine went to. And it's always been the case that jazz studies, for instance, has been sort of pushed out to the margin. It's because the conservatory model, uh, it's really designed around the European classical idiom. And I understand that. And it makes sense that that is what's considered the tradition. And it is what is considered uh, central to that model. So, <laughs> but jazz has sort of been pressed out to the side uh, and has been marginalized. And even in the, the terminology that is regularly used, um, calling classical music legit, which which means that anything that's not classical music is illegit, okay? Uh, calling uh, jazz, you know, musicians calling them jazzers. Uh, uh, and they people that are using this terminology may not understand how that is belittling, but to make something, a serious study of something, uh, to make it sound so, um, uh, you know, 
you know, unserious in it doesn't take any real work or effort, you know, calling someone a jazzer, you know, uh, there, I mean, there are, there are scores of these examples in what I find interesting is that if in the arts, it's a 40 to three ratio between Democrats and Republicans. I thought it was that the Republicans were the racist ones. And I'm not a Republican, but I'm just pointing this out <laughs> that the Republicans were the racist ones. Um, they were the ones that wanted to oppress black people. They were the ones that were in support of things like cultural appropriation. And it was the the good Democrats, which are the defenders of the black people, right? The de defenders of of you know uh, all things uh, beautiful, you know this kind of thing. And what you find is that at least in my experience, and in a lot of my colleagues' experiences, but friends around the country working at different institutions. Um, it has been it has been these Democrats that have kept <laughs> they have kept the institution, uh, you know, these schools of music, these conservatories the way that they are, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and not progressive at all, in other words. Um, and hey, so I, I at, can hear somebody listening. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, at most. At most, uh, overtly racist, and at least very insensitive, and uh, not even open to making progress. Um, so I think that those views are views that have to change, and uh, it seems that right now there's a little bit more openness to have conversations about these topics, but. I don't know how that long that's going to last. And, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a realist. I don't think it's going to last long at all. Hey, so, so this stuff that you're saying about a liberal bias in, in university life, is that consistent with your experience? Absolutely. Um, now yeah. I'm a, you know, I'm a Christian and, uh, I'm pro-life for instance. Uh, a pro-life perspective uh, in particular is not something that I feel comfortable openly expressing at, you know, at say town halls or something, you know, where I, you know, where I work at. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, to it's totally been my, it, it, it's totally been my experience or anything that sounds like it's conservative. It might not necessarily be a conservative uh a platform. It might not be a Republican, you know, platform item. It could just be something that sound like, you know, I think that I should take personal responsibility for, you know, for myself and for my community. You know, <laughs> I could, you know, it often it's like you have to frame things in a certain way so that they, they don't get heard, <laughs> you know, uh, as if you're part of the, uh, the enemy's team, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting, man. So I'm curious as to how how you think it got this way, because I, I can see someone who is liberal saying, hey, don't don't be mad at us for being the ones to complain about. I mean, to care about higher education. Where where are you guys at? If you don't agree, like, couldn't they say we're dominating higher education? That's why we got all the professor jobs. That's why we're. What's your take on that? How do we get to that position? It's it's interesting because um, in conversations that I've had with um, with people, one of the things that's come out is well, the reason why there is this bias is because as you learn more, and as you you know, if you have a certain you know intelligence level plus a certain knowledge level, then it naturally leads to be being liberal. That's why all of these very intelligent people are, are liberal, right? Because those positions are the right positions. They're the correct positions to hold. Um, and I think it's more, it's more like, 
uh, I think it's strategic. I think, uh, I, I don't have a precise way to respond to this, uh, without maybe going into certain details that maybe I don't want to bring up in this context, but <laughs> I think there's some, some strategy to, uh, to sort of monopolizing Hollywood and academia with respect to making certain lasting social adjustments uh, that are desired. Yeah, th this, this is one that I think will be worth following up on because I, I hear what you're saying about, about the bias and I also believe that that's the sort of cultural reality in any context that's dominated by any specific demographic, right? If, 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 if I go into uh, an all Christian space, I'm going to experience that space very differently if I'm an atheist versus if I'm a fellow Christian. If I go into an all black space, I'm going to experience that space very differently if I'm a white person versus if I'm a, another black person. So however we divvy it up in terms of religion, in terms of race, in terms of politics, I, I would expect that there's a, a certain amount of group think, there's a certain social dynamic that occurs when the majority of people in that space share the same basic ideology, political, religious, religious whatever. I'm, I'm just very curious about how we got to a place where the people that are dominating higher education happen to be of a specific political ideology and, and why why that would not be taken as an argument for that ideology. I'm not advancing it as such, but I just think that's a very interesting question. So we should come back to it. Um, I, I, I want to pause here and I want to read some more comments and I want to have I, I want to have us both riff on them. Let's let's try to you know keep it relatively short. But uh, so Stephen Hill has a what, what sounds like a, oh, a response to me. Third party sounds attractive at first until one of the other parties declines in significance. Then we're back to two parties. So a third party scenario will be temporary. Yeah. So for me, I just thought, you know, Larry Sharp's argument for third parties was pretty interesting. But um, I'm a full blown voluntarist. And as far and as guess, then we're back to uh -oh, two parties. So a third party scenario will be temporary. Apologies. Yeah, I'm a full blown voluntarist and my my theory of social change is turtles all the way down when it comes to entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking. I, I personally have zero faith in the political system. So I'll let you guys have the discussion about who you can vote for. I'll let you all have that. And, and, and you can find me wherever there are discussions about what what um, what us individuals can do. Uh, and y'all just fill me in the day after the election day, you know, when, when everybody's ready to get back to work. But Thunder, you have anything you want to say on that? Yeah. After that comment, you should have just stood up and just walked off. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, 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 I mean, I, I agree with, uh, th what you're saying. Um, I don't have a lot of faith in, 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 politics, at least not the way that we've been doing politics, uh, with virtually no communication or conversation occurring and only talking points. You know, this guy says his talking point, and this guy says his talking point, and then they go to the next show, and they're studying the same talking points, and nothing has even changed. Um, it's just a numbers game. It's like if I stay on these these talking points, you know, when they do the poll, the poll is going to show that, you know, I got a little bit more with, you know, the suburban woman vote, or I got a little bit more with whatever. And so they have turned this into a uh, sort of a science with respect to staying on those talking points. But that doesn't really help us with respect to actually advancing, you know, in, any, uh, you know, new perspectives. So. 
Yeah, man. And, you know, hey, I've, I've had a lot of people get mad and say, hey, man, are you downplaying politics? And, and look, I'm 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 not going to be the guy that's that's chasing you down, trying to tackle you as you're heading for the, uh, the, the voting booth. But but do come talk to me. Do come talk to me uh, if and or when you um, you don't like that election result and, and you feel discouraged because I love to have conversations about how there are thousands of other things that we can be doing to move the needle in the right direction. But that's th that's just the way I see it. Let's let's keep reading these comments. Um, Tim, uh, let's see, Tim Micaselli, I know there are benefits to organizing as a group, but I'd be okay if there were no political parties at all. Hey, hey Tim, I'm, I'm with you on that. Like, why even hide behind a party? Just let your ideas speak for themselves. Let's see. Thunder, you want to add anything on that? Well, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, I don't want to make this sound like I'm anti-fraternity or something, but uh, the reason that I never joined a fraternity is because I just find a certain, uh, a certain pleasure in the idea that I can do something myself. I don't require uh, certain official associations to, to sort of uh, uh, make my words or, uh, you know, make it easier for me to establish certain connections. I, I just want to try to do it. Um, now, obviously, all of us need other people and networking is very important. And of course, someone that's in a fraternity is going to say, yeah, but fraternity is just a network. And I suppose they'd say the same thing about political parties. Hey, well, you know, we just happen to be people that just agree on some of the same things. And so that we have more power when we do this, it's easier to do whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't understand that. Yeah. I got you, man. All right, so I've got John Mullen saying, thank you for that statement on responsibility. Where I see the reaction to words like responsibility is due to the victim attitude that too many people have adopted. When you mentally choose to approach life as a victim, you only see that as a negative. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. And I'll, I'll tell you though, having coached a lot of people at different levels on on how to overcome challenges or how to achieve goals. I, I tell you a, an important part of thinking strategically is finding the freedom to be honest about stuff that's going on in your life that you not only hate, but that puts you at a real disadvantage, right? So, so if I'm coaching you and, and, and your goal is to start a business, it helps to know if you are coming at this from a position of not having any wealth and not knowing any people who have it. We're going to do some different things than if I'm talking to somebody that's got a Rolodex full of people that have money that want to invest in them. Right. So I think in the same way that people who react negatively to the term responsibility, I, I think I think on the other side, there are some people who maybe go too far with their use of the term victim. I don't think you're a victim just because you complain about something that you don't like. I don't think that you are a victim just because you claim to have disadvantages. I do believe disadvantages are real, and I believe that any critical and creative thinker will want to know what they know what they are, because the only way that you can go over them, go under underneath them, find a way around them or through them is to is to see them for the obstacles that they are, and and then you can transform them or negotiate them or whatever you have whatever you have. So it's not so much about talking about the problem or the disadvantage; it's about making sure that you don't let that be the final the final word on the discussion you know um, and, and I think a key a key aspect to reaching a lot of people that we kind of throw that label on oh you guys just have a victim mindset is actually connecting with people and saying hey look I think a lot of these disadvantages you're talking about are real let's have a conversation about the way to deal with those disadvantages effectively. You know, that's how you move the conversation forward, as opposed to like, I'm going to shut the discussion down on the things that you're whining about because I'm tired of this victim mindset. That's my take on it, man. What about you? One of the things that makes it difficult as a black man in America, hearing the sort of um, the platform of, of the Democratic Party is that 
it's as if they're trying to convince you that um, why even try? Everything is stacked against you. You have no shot at doing this. Um, even if you have a great idea, you still need other people to, you know, to do X, Y, and Z, and and they're going to oppose you. And and it just that's what it sounds like the whole time I I, I hear it. And um, that's not been my personal story. Uh, and frankly, that's not been the story of uh, you know successful black people. Um, they've not bought into that you know, that, uh, that sort of victim narrative. Um, mm. I, uh, and, and I'm very concerned about my son and him ever developing any kind of sense that because he's black, that's going to be the reason why he can't accomplish something or because he's, you know, um, whatever because he's the the color he is the, because he's the height that he is because he is you know whatever whatever you know insert your your list of things that the democrats claim are supposed to be crippling you know limitations you know on you uh, i don't want him to hear any of that that garbage i don't want him to and and even with all of the protesting right now um yeah do i want him to know at some point in his life that there have been some issues that have sought to, to, to make it harder for black people. Sure. Am I going to, uh, am I going to try to expose him to that right now and totally ruin him? Of course not. It would be no different. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking about this, you know, with musicians, with kids that start playing, you know, the, that whole thing about, you know, what's the way to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. That's the, that's the way to Carnegie Hall. Now, what kind of, you know, you know, what kind of terrible person, terrible teacher would fill the student's head with, well, but you know, there's a lot of politics involved and you got to make sure you get the right agent and you got to make sure you kiss a lot of butts on the way up. You know, mm -hmm. you got to make sure that, you know, you're not, you don't appear to be better than whoever the leader in the band is. You got to make sure that people only think that you play one instrument because they'll be intimidated if you play too many instruments. You got to make sure that you only, you know, what kind of, it, you know, you're, you're ruining the kid filling their head with a bunch of crap that has nothing to do with if they're going to be focused and dedicated to something and go after it with ferocity. That's the stuff that's important, you know, and, and, you know, and I see the same thing uh, with, uh, again, hearing a lot of the things that the Democratic Party says. If my son was to hear uh, a lot of these talking points what would he think? <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, so I, I don't look at those conversations in terms of um, like what Democrats say versus what Republicans say. And, and, I, and I still have a lot to learn in terms of being able to know how to categorize some of these things in terms of like what people who are in different political groups are more inclined to do. Because I'm just... I'm a political atheist in that regard. You, you, I mean, I've had plenty of time to say what I think about all that stuff, but I have heard a lot of these conversations in black families. And I do think there is an element of good to that kind of talk that perhaps doesn't get pointed out, maybe because it's equated with the mindset of someone who just whines all the time and avoids self-ownership. And, and it's this, one of the things you hear people say a lot is you can't go around acting like the world is against you or you can't go around acting like, you know, people want to bring you down. Now, my contention is actually you can go around thinking that way if you have evidence that somebody is against you. What's important, however, is if you have evidence that someone is against you, it's probably not going to do you very good to sit around whining about it or begging those people to be for you. But if someone is against you, it behooves you to know that so that you can effectively strategize around them. I think it's important to educate young people to not be naive. 
And part of not being naive means not everyone in the world is nice. Not everyone is fair. Not everyone actually lives out the philosophy of judging people by the content of their character. Some people are going to judge you and be unfair to you and even try to bring you down for all sorts of reasons, the presence or the absence of money, your whiteness or your blackness, the way you look. Some people will feel threatened because they think you're prettier than them. Some people will, will, will whatever it may be, we live in an unfair world where it is true that some people have hidden agendas and they are against you. They are against you. And you're never gonna be successful if you go through life naive about that fact. Some people wanna bring you down for all kinds of terrible reasons. The important thing though, is to not give up because of the existence of those people or to not use those people as an excuse for you failing to sit back and say, okay, given the situation that I find myself in, how can I still be the predominant creative force in my, in my life? I had a sports psychologist, Dr. Um, Kevin, Kevin El 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 Elkin on the show. And one of the things he said is his favorite phrase is, so what, what's next? That person does hate you. So what? What's next? What are we going to do about it? You know, that person is lying about you. So what? What's next? What are we going to do about it? But it is important that we don't be naive. And, and, and I think I think a, a, an important part of conversations that happen in Black families around that kind of stuff, it's coming from a place of, I do want you to work hard. I do want you to believe in your talent. But I also want you to understand that when certain things happen or if certain things happen, I don't want you to be shocked and traumatized for it because I do want you to be able to go on. And if you go through the world naive, you'll be too shocked to go on. Yeah, I think my my point uh, is about what is the appropriate timing for that mm. information. Um, and because what I'm seeing right now is that there's a lot of little kids that are being used as props and mm. or are being taught certain things that I don't think is appropriate for them to even be aware of at this point. Mm. Yes, tell them about it later. And, um, it, it, but right now, as you're getting started, as you're still forming your ambitions and your dreams and you're, you're still full of wonder and hope and you just see all of this wide world and creativity and all of this stuff, you know, well, none of that, you can't get any of that stuff. That, that stuff, not, that mm. stuff is not for people that look like us. That stuff mm. is for, for, for them over there. Um, and that's just never going to be, uh, 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 you know, that's just never going to be, uh, you know, those are not going to be excuses that my son will ever be allowed to make. Um, it was one of the best things that my dad did for me. And that was, he would not allow me to make excuses. He would not allow me to make excuses. You know, the, the most stern lectures and punishments I received as a kid were because I was trying to make excuses. Mm. He would not let me make excuses. That's that's the thing, and and he's a Democrat, <laughs> which which is uh, kind of a <laughs> funny twist here. <laughs> hey man, and it's a good illustration of the fact to, to to make sure that we're always striving to to see people as people, right? Because in, in in every demographic, including the ones we slap labels on, being like you know you guys are the bad guys, uh, there are people that are a lot more like you that some folks who aren't in your demographic. And you and I have talked about that during the days we used to have a lot of discussions about apologetics. I I have met some atheists who in many ways I've had more in common with than maybe somebody that I grew up in church with, you know? So it, it is important to keep that open mind. But I, I like that lesson your father taught you. You know, one of the things my, my mother taught me is that God loves you and I love you, but everybody ain't gonna love you like I do. And everybody ain't going to love you like God does, <laughs> you know, so always maintain that confidence in God's love. And whenever you address anyone, you do so from a consciousness of the self-respect that comes from knowing you are a child of God. And at the same time, understand it's other people who have zero belief in that 
or zero respect for that. So you got to stand tall, even if it means uh, being willing to stand alone. There are so many comments. Um, I really appreciate y'all. Uh, Stephen, definitely be resilient. Uh, and um, uh, gosh, uh, I'm going through some of these. Uh, Lara G, Lara G, Marco, good points. Uh, debates that are televised today are not really debates, more like Q and A's, talking points, as you said. Um, respond to your comment, Thunder. Absolutely true. Uh, and yeah, lo lots of different things here. I I'll have to save these comments so maybe we can come back and and and, and build on some of this discussion and say more. Uh, uh, yeah, we ran out of time, man. Thunder, I'm gonna give I'm gonna pass the mic to you and give you give you the final word, bro. Well, you know. Uh, always enjoy our time. It seems like we're going to have to do this more often, man. Uh, there's a, a lot to talk about. Um, and uh, it's always uh, it's always great chopping it up with you, man. Yeah, likewise, brother. I appreciate your time, man. Thanks for hanging out. And we will do this again. Um, you you want to do this bi-weekly, man? You want to try that out? Definitely. Yeah, okay. So what we'll do is we'll start giving people a, a better heads up by by posting at least a week out from where we're going to be on so y'all can prepare for it. But I hope you enjoy the conversation. And, and if you're listening to this and we're not live, don't let that discourage you from making comments or asking questions or just pointing things out that you would like us to read or think about or respond to, um, because I will be coming back to look at these and maybe importing some of that into a future conversation. But everybody, you all have an awesome weekend and uh, keep fighting for freedom and everything that you do and live as fully as you can. Peace.